Okay, uh, it's five after, so I'm going to get started. So this talk, just to make sure everyone's in the right place, because I know how much everyone loves .NET, this is a talk on .NET exploitation. Um, I don't purport to claim that I will make you all, all experts and super lead .NET hackers by the end of this talk, but I'd like to just kind of give you a little flavor for what kind of throws into the art of uh, .NET bug hunting, uh, reverse engineering, and eventual exploitation. Okay, so for those who didn't you know, see my name on the sign out door, my name is Kelly Lum. I am presently, I just recently started a few months ago as a security engineer at Tumblr. Uh, this is after about a nine, 10 year stint working in finance and the government space. So this is just a completely new paradigm shift for me. But I've been working in application security for most of that time. So uh, a lot of this talk just comes from those years of experience. Working in the corporate world, you do see a lot of enterprise languages like .NET. Um, I started to get a love-hate relationship with Microsoft in general and Microsoft languages because I wrote my first uh, program in QBasic when I was very, very young. And I guess that kind of put me on the path where I am now, just kind of scarred me for life and that's kind of what I've been doing. There's going to be a lot of animated GIFs in this talk. I do run the blog, uh, most people know me for Security Reactions Tumblr. So um, they may be unprofessional, but they are kind of funny. And this is me at work. So why did I decide to do a talk on .NET? I mean, everyone does talks on reverse engineering. Everyone does talks on application security. And one of the reasons that I got interested in .NET in the first place is because it, it's basically Microsoft's answer to Java. And we all know, we, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room has had a night of, you know, mild hair loss from pulling, pulling at your scalp trying to get Java bugs fixed or Java JR, or get the JRE patch or whatnot. And since .NET is very similar to Java in very respects, is what the language looks like, the fact that you can have multiple versions of, of runtimes on a, a single operating system, and made it kind of curious to me that there weren't a lot of talks about .NET vulnerabilities. You see, you know, whenever a new vulnerability in Java comes out, Twitter just blows up about it. But when something in .NET comes out, it's like, meh. And it does get used a lot in enterprise places. You know, you may not see it as a, at a small startup, but you may see it as, at a large company, like a bank, or, uh, you know, not to, not trying to think of an example where I'm not naming names, but, you know, may, maybe a large financial organization, maybe a large corporation or whatnot. Obviously, Microsoft uses it in a lot of places. So, you know, there is an opportunity there. There's sort of a niche that, if we want to find some interesting bugs, uh, it's a corner that, is sort of increasingly getting more eyes, but I think that we could look at it a little bit harder. So before we can talk about how to sort of reverse engineer .NET apps, how to uh, you know look at the code, how to um, determine whether things are vulnerable, we should probably understand a little bit of how .NET works. And at the core of .NET is this thing called the Common Language Infrastructure. Basically, all that means is that you can write your application in any .NET framework supported language, and regardless of what you use, or regardless of what you use, that the compiler what for your language will turn your code, your source code, into bytecode, which is called the common intermediary language code. And then at runtime, the common language runtime is going to convert that into the native code that is what is going to end up running on our system. Uh, most popular ones are C Sharp and Visual Basic. I have met precisely two people who use F Sharp. It's actually kind of a fun language, but it's not very commonly used. But the point is, is that there are, you know, whatever kind of language you're comfortable in writing in, it's eventually going to be converted into something that looks pretty much the same. C Sharp or Visual Basic all become CIL code. And for people, just for anyone who isn't really familiar with what CIL code looks like, this is just a small little function that I wrote in C Sharp. If you look at the names of you know, the variables in the function name, you can see that I have just created a uh, event for clicking on a button. And what happens when you click on the button, I was in a very dark mood when I wrote this code, uh, a little message, you'll click on a button, a little message box with a message will come up. And this below is the equivalent 
common intermediary language code. So you can still see that we're creating a, a function called button one click. You can still see my string down here. It, it, now it's become a load string. And you can see that it's calling a value type, and this is basically calling system windows form, which is the uh, form assembly for creating you know, those nice little graphical applications in Windows. And then we're getting the dialog result, and we're getting the message box, and it's basically saying show string. So the string that it's going to use is the one that's been pushed up here. Then you get a pop to uh, get the a return type off the stack, perhaps, and then a return, so you're exiting out of the function. Most people say this looks a lot like assembly. I don't like to say that because people who really love assembly get mad at me, but you can see that there are some similarities. Another thing that I want to get into before we actually start talking about bugs is the format of uh, .NET files, the PE file format. What's interesting about this to me and what may kind of make things a little bit more sense when you talk about reverse engineering a .NET app, maybe decompiling it or disassembling it, um, decompiling is the more accurate word for that, is that um, this information is in a very, very easy to parse table format. Everything is in a table and every, or a metadata string. And so it's very easy for a tool like Reflector to go through uh, the contents of these files and convert, even though it's in CIL when you're looking at it, when you open it, um, it's very easy to turn it back into the original code or something that represents the original code. So just to give you a little bit of um, overview of what's in there, you see that we have these different metadata strings. And it contains all the information about the application or the assembly. You have a user string heap, so that's all the strings embedded in source. That string that I wrote in my previous example where it said I'm in a hell of my own creation, that would, you probably see that user string heap somewhere. Uh, when you define namespaces and types and members, you're going to probably see that in the strings metadata stream. And then any sort of types and methods, fields, properties that uh, have been predefined content, that's going to go into the tilde stream. So just to go into, the, into that first stream a little bit more deeply, and this is you know, not something that you're going to remember, but it's just to show you how very easily um, contained this this is, that this is a very easy to understand format once you actually know what the format is. So you see, you see type definitions, field definitions, methods definitions. You can define your events, okay? You can define properties. So there's a lot of very helpful information that if you were wanting to write a decompiler or whatnot, once you learn what the format is, the, the information is just very, very easy to get. So this is a, a tool that is uh, widely available. It's called CFF Explorer. And you can actually just browse the PE file format just using a hierarchical kind of folder layout. So you can see here, this is the application example that I showed you a few slides ago. And you can see that button one click and information about it is very, very easy to parse table, okay? And then if you just open it up in a hex editor, you can see that it's also quite easy to parse. So it's not showing up very uh, well on this slide here, but you can see that everything is, um, let's see if I can find a good one. So you can see someone here in here, there is a button, button one events arc. So all of this is plain text. All of this is very easy to uh, figure out what the original code looks like. Obviously, that makes people upset, especially people who are really concerned about protecting intellectual property. So to, as an answer to that, as sort of a reaction to the fact that things like Java, things like .NET are very easy to kind of run through and get the original code out of, we come into the arena of obfuscation. So if you're looking at a .NET application where you don't have the original source code, you're probably, I would say, I guess it depends on, um, you know, if you don't have permission to look at it, it's probably, it's, it's, you're probably going to have a fair chance of running into some obfuscation. So these are the most common ones that I've, I've looked through, 
And you can see sort of the various types of things that they try to do in order to make it harder for a decompiler uh, to get the original code back. Sometimes they'll do things like string encryption, where you know they are either it's real encryption where they actually are running some sort of uh, encryption algorithm like AES on, on your strings, and sometimes it's just some sort of weird encoding that isn't actually a cryptographic algorithm. Dependency merging isn't really obfuscation in and of itself, but it's a way of taking all of those little DLLs that you might find scattered across when an in, uh, application gets installed and basically just putting them into one nice file. You can do things where you obfuscate the method parent. This is the, the next few, uh, the next couple ones are basically ways of making it harder to determine the flow of code through the application, how your information is flowing through. So if you, if it, in a normal application, if foo calls bar, calls baz, these types of flow obfuscations are going to make it so that either put a lot of intermediary junk functions in, maybe make a weird circuit through the application that's not really there, and it's just going to make it a lot more cumbersome for you to figure out what exactly is going on in your application in terms of who calls who, what references what. Simple renaming is the one that makes me the most upset, just because I'm used to reading really, really bad code anyway, so when you see things like control flow or method parent obfuscation, to me it just feels like writing something reading code that was written by somebody who just really, really had been drinking really hard, okay? But for simple renaming, it's a little bit, it's, I would say it's significantly more ignoring, ignore, annoying, sorry, it's significantly more annoying because you don't get the original context of what, let's say, your function name was or your variable name. So, you know, if somebody names their function button one click, you get a pretty good sense of what's going on there, right? You say this function this probably has to do with handling the clicking of a button. If they rename it to dollar sign music note, then you really have no context of what that is. Sometimes they'll rename them to uh, unprincipled characters. So if you open it up in a decompiler, it's not even going to show you well, like it prints, it's basically going to be one of those annoying little boxes that you get. And so um, tamper detection is a way of basically trying to, you know, maybe using some hashing or, or whatnot to determine whether or not somebody has put code into the application, like bypass the code to uh, add code that wasn't there in the original compilation. And then we have resource and assembly encryption, which is, is exactly what it sounds like. You know, you have your application depends on this assembly.dll, then you might encrypt it so that somebody can, makes it harder for somebody to actually run a decompiler on it. Same thing with resources. Think of a resource, let's say you have your logo or something, you don't want somebody drawing something obscene on it, so you may encrypt it so that the application has to decrypt it before they can use it. Sorry, should have gotten water. Now, there are common uh, de-obfuscation tools out there. Uh, they do sort of mixed... Uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. They're, they're, um, some, are, some are really good. I guess some are really bad. You can rename your symbols back to something that's printable, for example, but you can't really um, get the context back if your symbols have been renamed to junk values. If you can find the, the key that, encrypt, that has been used for uh, encrypting, then you can decrypt. Uh, you can find code that doesn't do anything, maybe just a function that calls another function, take that middleman function out and then reconnect the two functions together. Uh, tamper detection, basically you have to figure out how they're doing that. If you see some, some sort of hashing going on, then you can probably just remove that functionality out there. Sometimes, like I said before, if you're used to reading really bad code, sometimes just read the obfuscated code. I mean, it has to run anyway. If you can trace the flow through the application without doing obfuscation, um, then you're probably a god of some sort. But depending on the level of obfuscation, sometimes it's not even worth getting the original code back. Oh, thank you very much. So 
another thing that is important when we're working with .NET, especially if you're going to do something crazy like modify an assembly, is the concept of strong name signing. The point of this is to guarantee that the assembly is the assembly that you think it is. So you have two assemblies with the same name, strong name signature would prevent you from confusing one with the other. Make sure you're using the right version also. So you don't want to use version 2, you want to use version 3, strong name signature would help you make sure that that is you're using the right one. And make sure that it hasn't been tampered with, for example. You know, I will go into how we can tamper with some of these assemblies. You probably, um, you know, can think of some really um, obvious reasons why you would not want something, somebody tampering with an important assembly. For example, one that does your cryptography. Now, strong name signing sounds really, really great. But, and this is just something I took right from the Microsoft blog. Most applications do not um, check strong name signatures. This is something that doesn't usually happen by default, and I'll go into how you can make it happen by default, but, and this is just right off Microsoft blog, the presence of a strong name attribute does not necessarily mean that the validation takes place. In a full trust scenario, the attribute is never considered because the signatures are never validated. A first full trust scenario, you can think of maybe perhaps your desktop application. So, yes, they're there, but it's a feature. Like, like most good things in life, you have to take advantage of the good thing. It doesn't just do it for you. Now, this talk is about .NET exploitation, and I am going to start to get into that now. But I don't want to talk about the common things we talk about when we when people think of .NET, they think of web applications, they think, and when you think about web applications, you think about cross-site scripting, you think about uh, CSRF, you think about SQL injection, and I'm pretty sure, you know, this, you know, you pay attention to OWASP, you probably know what those things look like. So I'd like to go into things that are kind of special about .NET, and these are some things that you'll also see in Java as well. But these are issues that you wouldn't necessarily see in some of the other languages that you're used to dealing with, or at least not in this sort of uh, way. These are basically, I'd say, if cross-site scripting and web bugs are sort of your entry level, these are, you know, your, uh, or junior level bugs, this is going to be like your senior level, or your, your advanced course bugs. So the ones I'm going to talk about are scoping bypasses, is, and this is where you basically take advantage of the reflection um, capabilities of .NET. There's also something called a learning attack or a trusted chain attack, where, and we'll talk about the security model in .NET, where you take advantage of trusted code calling untrusted code and trick that trusted code into running something that, it's, uh, that is untrusted. So you are basically taking advantage of um, the protection mechanisms built into .NET. And then there's objects deserialization issues or serialization issues. I won't go in those, into those too much because that is just something that is consistent with any sort of language that uses serialization. But it's another thing to keep in mind if you see an application doing, playing around with serialized objects. You want to make sure that if there's any untrusted data that that is handled properly. Why does Keynote never autoplay my here? Just making sure how I am on time. So reflection is the art of manipulating objects at runtime. And obviously this is a very powerful feature of a language. And with any sort of quite powerful feature, you also run into very, very bad ways it can be abused. So especially when we're talking about extending an object dynamically as the program runs. You can probably just use your imagination and think of some ways that could be abused. So if you have a class or whatnot that has a few objects in it and you use untrusted data to change the properties of those objects, then you are basically changing the complete characteristics of, um, of that application, right? Uh, if you're using dynamic code generation, any sort of lambdas or whatnot, and you use uh, something from the user to do that dynamic code generation. You may end up generating bad code. Um, 
maybe you're manipulating types, changing a type from one type of, from an integer to a string, back and forth or whatnot. If you get a type, if you're always assuming that the user is going to give you a certain type and they give you a different one, then obviously bad things can happen, right? You've all seen people who expect everything to be a string and then it turns out to be an integer and you know, you're know you doing some sort of database query or whatnot or some sort of command. So you've seen bad things happen there. It's the same thing in reflection, right? Uh, if you're doing any sort of checking at runtime for things on the operating system, and modifying your code, you know, based on what's going on there. Then, if um, the uh, user can manipulate, you know, something that you're running at, uh, sorry, sorry, something that you're doing at runtime, then um, they can change the flow of your application because you, maybe you modify it for what um, a good example that I like to see. Sorry, I'll just go into an example. Um, sometimes you'll load up a something in an environment, let's say like a virtual machine, and you load it differently in a virtual machine than let's say a native operating system. You may do something differently in a virtual machine than in a native operating system. Maybe because you are worried about somebody trying to reverse engineer, uh, or you know, sorry, I'm flaking out right now. You know, you're, you're worried about somebody maybe like running debugging on it and kind of looking at the contents of memory at runtime. So you may want to make some runtime checks to make sure that that sort of thing isn't happening. If you're using reflection to do that and somebody can manipulate the environment to make your application do crazy things, then you may be allowing them to manipulate parts of your code that you would not want them to. And this is, uh, this is, this is not look good in the, in the sunlight. I apologize. But this is just the hierarchy of reflection, right? At the very top, you have your assembly. And below that, you have you know, your methods, your fields, your events, your property info. This is just to let you know these are all of the different things that using reflection, you can manipulate. So when you're looking at your .NET applications, you should definitely make, you know, if you see any of these things being manipulated at runtime, pay very close attention to them and be pay very close attention to how they make the how the application makes decisions that would cause these to change. Now I'm going to go into the .NET security model just because a lot of the exploits that we're going to be talking about are ways to take advantage of the security model or rather to cause the application to not take advantage of the security model, right? You're going to have certain parts of code in your application that may be more trusted than others. So I want to talk about um, how access rights are determined. And when I talk about access rights, there's a lot of different access rights that are available to you in .NET. Maybe we're talking about something as simple as, you know, writing to file or reading from files. Maybe we're talking about interacting with the database. S certain parts of code, you would probably not want untrusted code to be doing those actions. You may only want uh, certain parts of your application or certain assemblies to be allowed to do that, certain classes to be able to do that, for example. One important thing to note is that we have a lot of different environments, especially when we see things like .NET. You may see something in a hosted environment where you have a lot of different trust levels, right? You may be running multiple web applications one part of the code is responsible for talking to the database, so it needs more trust. One part of the code is responsible for taking a user input and manipulating it, so that would probably want to run with less trust because it doesn't need it, right? On the desktop, managed applications are usually always granted full trust, unless somebody actually goes ahead and sandboxes that. I've never really seen somebody do that. If anyone actually does find a good way of doing that without making the installation process a nightmare, I would love to hear it because that would save me a lot of headaches for .NET desktop applications. So in terms of figuring out whether an assembly is allowed to access a certain permission set, we have something where we walk the call stack. So if we have, so each assembly has its own set of grants, things that it is allowed to do. And when an assembly requests a permission, 
we basically go up the stack of everything that's called it and check that permission against the assembly grants. The assembly is only allowed to use that permission if it matches the grant set. How do we determine, this is, one thing that I should note is that this is code access security for .NET 2. There is a whole new thing that's introduced in .NET 4 that makes this a lot less painful. Because in .NET 2 or in old school CAST, you have to set up evidences. Basically, things that the .NET can use to determine whether or not you're allowed to do what you're asking to do. So some of those evidences could be the application directory, the signature that the publisher has made for the assembly, the URL that's requesting the application, the name of the host on which the application is running, and so on. So just looking at this, you can see that this is probably something, especially when you're doing a rapid development environment, where you, uh, you know, need to get something out the door as soon as possible, you're probably not going to sit down. I mean, I know I do this because I'm lazy. You know, I just want to get it working. I don't want to think about, you know, how to make all of these as fine-grained and as least privileged as possible, right? So this is a lot of work. And when everything's, you know, people are inherently lazy, I'm lazy, we're all lazy. The more work you have to do, the more likely it is you're not going to do it or not going to do it rigorously. Um, just to go into a little bit more, these are some other things that would need to be defined, right? The application domain. So there's going to be a policy for which domains can execute what. Uh, which machines are, like if you have an active directory installation. Uh, for the current machine, maybe you have code that runs on different machines, you may have a policy per machine, or a policy per user is another one that's quite common. So remember, just to write, reiterate, with this code access security, it enforces constraints. Code is going to run with a certain trust level, and it's going to run, you can also create uh, custom permission sets, but the trust levels that we usually see are these full, high, medium, low, and minimal. Okay? When a code when code requests a protected operation, it's going to make a demand for that access. And then we're going to walk the execution to stack checking the permissions against the grants, just like I showed you in that diagram a few slides ago. And remember, code in the global assembly cache, and when I talk about the global assembly cache, what I mean is the code that is provided to you by .NET, part, the code that is part of the .NET framework. So MS Corelib, system.dll, those are, that is code in the global assembly cache and that always runs as full trust. And that's something that you need to keep in mind when we get further into the weeds of how we can exploit stuff. Because if we can get something in the global assembly cache to run our code, then we are going to get privilege escalation. This is just an example of what medium trust looks like. You're not allowed to event log, you're not allowed to use reflection, you can't call on managed code. Um, you can, with some restrictions, do uh, web interactive stuff and do file I.O. Um, this, I could show you every trust level, but you know, it's one thing, it's boring, and two, we really want to get closer to actually owning something or looking at how things get owned. Now in .NET 4, they try to, Microsoft really, you know, Microsoft admits it. Code access security is hard. Code access security takes a lot of work. And there's so many ways to do it that it basically, I mean, it's like me trying to pick out an outfit in the morning. I'm like, I got 4,000 pairs of shoes and I wear the same pairs of shoes every day because I'm just not, don't want to think about it. And I could dress myself nicer, but I don't want to think about it, and neither do most developers when, it, when they need to get something done fast. So in .NET 4, we get this new hotness of the security transparency. Remember, security trans one thing to keep in mind, security transparency is enforced in the JIT. When you do level 2, which is the one that they want you to use, it's using the .NET 4 rules. But if you go back to level one and have your application run with level one security transparency, you're basically going to the old rules that we talked about. So I stole this slide from Microsoft. When we have security transparency, we basically have three levels. Transparent, safe, critical, and critical. Transparent can only call 
save critical and itself. It cannot call critical code. It also cannot contain unverifiable code and cannot invoke native code. Um, it, can, it cannot do an assertion for permissions, and like I said, it cannot directly call critical code. Safe critical code is basically the bridge between transparent and critical. It can call itself, it can call critical, and it can call transparent. Transparent code is basically going to need to go through safe critical code in order to get through critical code. And critical code is basically our holy grail, the thing that we want. It's the full trust code, it can do anything, and it can access other critical code. And you can sort of see these lines where it's just transparent can only call itself and safe critical, safe critical can call down, and then critical can basically do whatever. So I've talked a lot about what .NET does, how it works, um, except for that five seconds where my brain just completely went blank. But that's sort of a good way to say it. There's a lot of stuff to know about .NET. There are just so many things about it, so many features that, you know, it's hard to figure out how to get a vulnerability in .NET. And what do we want to get a vulnerability in? Are we exploiting an application that uses .NET that, may, that somebody wrote in C Sharp or Visual Basic? Or do we want to get like a sweet framework bug, right? Um, when I talk about .NET exploitation, most people assume, you know, I want to find bugs in C Sharp and .NET. And those are very important. But you should remember that also the framework is also written in C Sharp and Visual Basic. Not all, of, all the assemblies, but a lot of them, you can see the equivalent code. Um, Microsoft is just starting or is, is doing a really good job of getting back on the open source kind of bandwagon. And they've actually released a lot of the ASP.NET code into GitHub. So it's not secret anymore. You don't need to decompile it. You can just go onto CoreNet, or I'm sorry, CoreFX GitHub account and pull down .NET code if you want to take a look at it. They also have a security resource for the rest of their framework code on their website where you can just see the source code of all of the .NET assemblies. So by showing you a .NET framework vulnerability, um, just because I say it's a framework vulnerability doesn't mean that these types of mistakes don't also happen in applications that a normal developer writes. So I'm going to go into, first I'm just going to talk about a couple or a handful of recent bugs that have come out in .NET. Um, they're very interesting because there are very, there are just such a wide variety of them. And so I also wanted to show you the affected assemblies, just in case, uh, and this is a good thing to do if you want to look at what .NET bugs look like. Just look up the CVEs, figure out what, where the affected assembly is, and just do a comparison of the, the, you know, the code before and the code after. Since it's very easy to get the actual code of it, you can just do a diff, and you can see where the problem was. So this most recent one, this code execution one, is in a part of .NET remoting. It's not very commonly used, but the way that it happened was uh, they were doing some something called type filter level checking, and it wasn't being properly performed. So if somebody passed a piece of it, passed a piece of data to the type filter level check, then it basically led to code execution. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to go not be this general about one specific bug, but I just want to give you kind of an overview of what we're looking at here. Okay, for the denial of service code execution one, this is where, um, so you know what, does everyone here know what an IRI is, an international resource identifier? It's sort of like a URI, but it's for international. Um, there was a vulnerability in that, where they were not properly parsing the, um, the IRI, the um, international resource identifier. So if you passed in a malicious one, you could either crash the application or in some instances get code execution. I like uh, CVE of 2014-473 because I thought it was kind of cute. It's basically a vulnerability in the click once installer. Basically, the click click once installer has two ways of operating. It has a com and it has a decom. With decom, you can actually have multiple processes talking to each other, and that's that. 
um, if one of the op if one of the um, processes is injecting information into the into this communication that is not uh, what what the other one expected. So I thought that was cute just because it's a it's not a vulnerability in the classical sense where it's like oh the application is not doing what it's doing, but it's um, in the actual installer before the application actually starts to run. There really isn't much to say about the ASLR bypass, but this is something that comes out a lot. This is something that I've been seeing a lot of bugs come out for when I look at .NET Framework historical bugs, is basically assemblies that don't have ASLR uh, properly implemented or just don't have it implemented at all. And so, um, you know, if you're relying on memory protection in order to um, avoid, you know, certain mem memory, you know, if you're relying on features like ASLR or um, you know ROP or what, whatever to prevent memory corruption bugs, well, .NET may make it easier for those to occur because some of their assemblies aren't doing it right. Uh, they've found a lot. I would say like five, which I guess doesn't seem like a lot, but it's it is what it is. Anyway, so the next, the one I want to talk about, and it is quite old. I'm not dropping O-Day here. This has been found. This has been patched. But this was just discovered by James Forshaw a couple of years ago. And the reason I like it, this is basically my pet example, because it is not only a vulnerability in .NET, but it's a vulnerability in a part of .NET that checks permissions. Okay, it's actually a vulnerability in security exception, which I thought was like, I, you know, I'm from Brooklyn, I really like irony, so I thought that finding a vulnerability in security exception was just like the cutest thing ever. It is a trusted chain attack, and so I think this is a good example of how you can talk about a tr how a trusted chain attack works. So remember, the issue is in system.security.security exception. You can get the source code from Microsoft. It's widely available on their website. But what security exception does is that it initializes an instance of the security exception class whenever a deny occurs. So remember, something is going to uh, act, ask for some permission. They're going to basically make a demand for something. And if they're not allowed to do what they're asking, for, then the security exception is going to get thrown. The bug in security the exception is a little hard to identify. Now you can see up here that a security exception is asserting full trust, and it is allowed to do that. It's in the GAC, it's allowed to run with full trust. That in and of itself isn't bad, but it does give us a little bit of a preview into why uh, this is an interesting function. Um, if we can find a problem in it. The problem happens here with demand. It looks innocuous enough. It basically looks like we're you know, assigning the value of demanded, the object demanded. We're just assigning that object to an you know, internal variable or internal object of some sort. But this is actually a method. So additional code gets called when this assignment happens. And the assignment looks like this. This is the set demanded function. And what it's doing is it's just taking the value that uh, was passed in from the previous function, and it is converting it to an XML string. That seems a little weird why they're doing that, but if you think about it, whenever you get some sort of error in an application, it usually, in debug mode, it will print out this, you know, ask for this permission, this is not allowed. And so they're converting it to an XML string uh, just to make it easier to um, indicate what was asked for, which is, which is not cool. So diving deeper into this XML conversion, we see, we eventually find another fact, another function that basically is just taking all of the security elements, uh, iterating through them, this is an array list of all the children of the object and doing conversion into creating, into turning them into XML. Yes? Oh, five minutes? Okay. So in order to exploit this, what we did is um, 
I created an overloaded 2XML function and created a new security element, all right? I also created this expression, and so what I'm going to do for this, and hang on, I just want to make sure that I'm explaining this correctly. I'm creating this expression object, and what happens is when I compile it, I will be able to bind it to a dynamic method. If I can bind it to a callback which runs with that full permission, then this process start calc is going to run with that full permission. So we're going to see how I bind it to that uh, callback in, in a few seconds. So basically what I'm just doing is creating a collection. This is something that is going to be iterated through in the XML conversion. Come on. And so I add the virtual item, which is my expression up here. I'm basically binding that to the retrieved virtual item. Okay. Then all I need to do, now that I have this compile function bound into virtual item, is add it to security element. This effectively overloads the XML conversion so that when the demand is made, I am going to run this and my start calc is basically going to run while the XML conversion occurs. This is going to run as full trust because security element runs as full trust. And that's the end of the book. All right, so I only have like four minutes left, so I'm just going to go through this really fast. I apologize. But one thing to know about the GAC is remember that it does not run JIT. It is basically pre-compiled. And what that means is that a lot of the checks that occur in just in time compilation do not occur when the GAC runs. So what we can do is just if we want to basically byte patch or modify the IL in, uh, what I did was take system drawing image and instead of displaying the image that I passed in, I um, am s s displaying a default image, a static image. I basically changed the uh, behavior of system drawing. Okay? The only problem, and this is the thing that I was talking about a long time ago, um, is the strong name bypass. Now, remember that we said before, strong name signatures are not validated when assembly is loaded into a full, to, full trust uh, object. That's not always true. Some, pe you, some people, and I've done this on my um, system, some people actually say, um, get rid of that, that bypass, and you can do that in um, your registry, or I'm sorry, for a single application, you can basically, uh, change that. For the whole machine, what you're going to do is change allow strong name bypass to zero to make sure that it does a strong name check every time. Uh, if you change it to one, then you effectively um, effectively guarantee that, that, that the strong name check is not going to occur. So on your system that you've compromised, if this isn't set, set it to one everything should be good for you to kind of modify things at your leisure. That's also if you want to defend against this and you see this value change, you've probably seen something bad happening. So remember that I said um, the GAC assemblies are pre-compiled. So what I need to do is pre-compile my assembly and replace the um, original one with my, uh, non, my dirty one, okay? So what you first do is you un uninstall the original, and this is the command to add your uh, new native image to replace it. All right. So I'm just going to show you what happened. This is from my favorite movie. So on this side, we can see the original application on a clean system. All I'm doing is passing in an image and saying, display this animated GIF. Now this is the exact same code running on the dirty system. And you can see here, um, if we go back to the slide before just to show you, I basically said, instead of whatever is passed into draw an image, just pass db.gif. So when I run it on my dirty machine, instead of getting the image that I passed into the function, I am getting Now that's just 
just a cute little example, but I've done some bad things with this where um, I was drunk and I changed some of the functionality so that it was, for example, um, every time I tried to write to a database instead of you know writing an error log or whatnot, it was just writing, ha ha, drunk Kelly strikes again. You know, you need to figure out where you changed this code. Um, sometimes for web stuff, I would put um, I input a new uh, a new implementation of the blank tag just because I missed it so much. So whenever you use the blank tag, it was actually a blank tag. That was pretty good. But these are if you were actually interested in doing this, and obviously don't use these files for good and not evil. These are some of the interesting assemblies that you might want to hook into. Uh, this is just a reference slide for later. Um, and I know I've gone over a little bit, but um, any questions, concerns, corrections? Yes? Can you rewrite some of these in the gap that we got loaded first? Yeah, so what I use is I usually just use Reflector, and I just modify the already compiled assembly. Yep. Can the uh, obfuscation run in memory be defeated when it's just a memory dump or something like that? Yeah, so uh, one thing that's interesting to look for if you kind of just, if you look at memory and you see some like an encryption key would need to be loaded in memory if they're doing any sort of resource or assembly encryption. That's uh, one of the things that I usually look for because anything that's encrypted has to be eventually decrypted and I just try to figure out where that's occurring. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about transparent versus secure critical and critical, uh, what can't secure critical do? So secure critical doesn't run with full trust, so it still doesn't have all the all the um, the permissions. But if we want to go all the way back to that slide, just so I can right. So it basically is just the middleman to provide um, transparent, which basically doesn't have very much of any sort of permissions. It allows transparent to. Um, call into critical without directly doing it. So it sort of acts as the gateway, um, and this is where you would do your validation, right? If you know you have your untrusted code at sitting in transparent where all of this the sketchy, dirty stuff comes in, this is where you'd want to do validation to say, uh, I need to sanitize this input. I need to make sure that this is an integer, not a string, or vice versa. But there are functions that you can't perform. Yes, yeah, it cannot perform. Um, you know, critical stuff. It shouldn't be able to, for example, manipulate registry keys. All right, cool. If any, I know that I kind of like, um, you know, I apologize I didn't have my coffee this morning, but if anyone has any other questions, uh, you can either do, 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 do. Oh, um, on Twitter, I am Aloria, A-L-O-R-I-A, or you can email me, kelly at tumblr.com, or just find me, I'll be wandering around looking shell-shocked. Thanks.